So we've been going over a lot of after action reviews and talking about motorcycle crashes and what to do in these types of situations, but I never really gave you, you know, what to do. So today what we're going to be doing is going over an older video of mine that I've kind of been sitting on and it's the introduction to accident scene management. Now this is not the full class. This is not even the first quarter of the class. So in order to get the full credit, in order to get the full information, you're going to have to go to accentscene.org and sign up for their online class. The good thing is they allowed me to use code DDFM for $5 off the online class. Okay, I don't get anything out of that. It's just a good discount for you guys. So make sure you go there and take the full class. But this is an introduction, a little trial, I guess, and uh, hopefully you guys like it. What is up everybody, Dan Dan the Fireman here, and I'm here to talk to you about what to do after a motorcycle crash. If you've watched any of my live streams, we talk about you know what happens prior to the crash, what's happening during the crash, and what to do afterwards, but we never really could get in depth. Let's just jump into it because we're going to be learning quite a bit. All right, so first and foremost, this is an introduction to the ASM 100 series basic instructor-led class. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, so what is that? Uh, the ASM is Accident Scene Management, and it's a full on program that you're going to learn, you know, from the basics all the way to advanced stuff on how to take care of somebody that's been injured. So the goal of this video series and the goal of this PowerPoint and me being on a green screen is uh, we're trying to reduce injury and fatalities to motorcyclists. Now, motorcyclists, as we all know, uh, we are not protected. We are just not protected. Even with the best gear, the best training, things can still happen. And when they do happen, they are very severe. They're not like a car accident where you have airbags and seatbelts and all that stuff. We don't, we're exposed. We're super exposed. So that's the goal of this video is to reduce injury and fatality. Also, as an, as a rescuer, if you're going up to help somebody, you don't want to be injured. And we're thinking a lot, you know, well, injured as in, well, how I'm going to get hit by a car. Well, that's part of it. There's a chance that you could get hit by a car if you're out on stopping on the road trying to help somebody. But another thing a lot of people don't think about is bloodborne pathogens, inhalation pathogens, um, exposure to heat. So now you have a heat stroke. So there's different things out there that you kind of want to think about and we want to protect the rescuer. Uh, so increase the effectiveness of EMS. Uh, what does that mean? Well, uh, we're going to right there on the bottom, it says learn what to do in the first five to 30 minutes after a crash until professional help arrives. That's the goal. We're going to be bridging that gap from the moment the crash happened until professional help arrives. Usually the five to 30 minutes that could happen, somebody can die. And the whole point is that we're trying to reduce the injury and fatalities, right? So we're going to increase the effectiveness. So all they have to do is load and go, take them to the hospital, trauma center, wherever they're going. We're also going to be focusing on trauma. So you notice how I said trauma center, we're going to be focusing on trauma itself. There can be a medical underlying issue that happened prior to the accident that caused the accident. You don't know if they're having it. We don't have x-ray eyes, we don't have heart machines, we don't have any of that stuff. All we can do is focus on what we see, and for the most part, that's trauma. And in a motorcycle accident, it's always going to be trauma. And if there's something that's medical underlying, let the professionals do that because they have all the equipment. So what is accident scene management? Here, here we go. We got we got all these crazy things up here. We got the patch above my head. We got road guardians and accident scene management, all these different things. So what is that? There's so much stuff going wrong. All right, so accident scene management was established in 1996. So think about that. That's been around for a very long time. It's been around for a long time, and that means they've been working hard and making sure that they are upping their game and they're they're you know remixing and redoing all their things so that they know what's best and it's all certified. So I'll go into that. They're the leader in motorcycle trauma first response. So I mean, whenever you hear about how to help somebody out on the side of the road that's been injured, these are the people that are that are running it. They're, they're the ones starting everything and, and making it happen. They're a great resource for bystanders and professionals. So when I looked at some of the stuff on online and, and when I took the class, I was like, wow, we're learning a lot of EMT things. So that's a lot of EMT stuff and a lot of EMTs that might need a refresher. It's really good stuff. And we're going to be going over a lot of that today. Also, once again, the goal is to reduce injuries and fatalities to motorcyclists through first response training. So that's their goal of road guardians and accident scene management. That fits me very well. I love it. Also, ASM certified patches. So this patch above my head, uh, in order to even get that, you can't just go out and buy it. You have to take the class and pass. So after this, you, you can't just say, hey, I, I took a class. You really have to go take a class. So if that's very important to you, to let you everyone know if you're a road captain for your club or, or a tail gunner for your club, you want them to know, hey, I know what to do in just in case you crash. 
I know how to protect my brothers and sisters. So having that patch is actually very important. Right, so who are the road guardians? Once again, you get that awesome patch, but uh, it's a massive database of safety resources. So there's a huge database on what to put in your emergency kit, what to do in case of uh, somebody crashes, how to do jaw thrust, all these different things. We're gonna be learning a lot of that today too. Over a thousand discounts through Smart Savings, so you get some perks. You get, you definitely get some perks. So what that is is, uh, you know, so if something there's like sales going on online or everywhere, and you get access to that. All right, and then certifiable recognition through their patches and other branded materials. So just like I said, that patch, you get some pins and a bunch of other stuff. All right, so who am I? Who am I? I think you guys know who I am. But if you're new to this channel, um, I do a lot of motor vlog stuff where I talk about motorcycle safety. But I'm Daniel, aka Dan Dan the Fireman. Uh, 10 plus years of firefighter EMT. So that's where I'm getting a lot of my knowledge from. That uh, MSF rider coach also. So I've been uh, practicing and training uh, other people and I've been tr working on my skills as when it comes to uh, motorcycle riding safety so that way I can prevent a lot of these accidents. I'm also an ASM level one instructor which means I'm an EMT and I can instruct and teach classes. Also, you guys should probably know this by now, a motorcycle safety content creator. You can find me on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all these other places. But for the main thing, those are the three right there, at Dan Dan the Fireman. What is the Good Samaritan law? I hear about that. Here's the thing. It goes, it varies by state by state. But we'll go over what is the Good Samaritan law in Arizona pretty soon. Uh, do you have a legal duty to act? What does that mean? The duty to act means that if you get certified, let's say you take this class in real life and you get certified, or even if you, after you're watching this, do you have to? Like, if you see an accident, do you have to stop? Do you have to provide care? So that's what it's called a legal duty to act. Um, how do I protect myself? So that could be anything. That could be in terms of, um, I mean, this is in a legal sense, but how do you protect yourself from getting sued? How do you protect yourself um, from somebody saying that, hey, this person groped me? We're going to we're gonna go over some of those uh, common issues. And when I say common, they're just common questions. They're not, they're not really issues. Anyways, let's go over what the Good Samaritan Law is. Uh, first and foremost, Arizona has had one for a little while. Um, but this one has been updated in January 2018. I'm, I just want you to know that right here, the law provides that any person who renders aid at the scene of emergency is not liable for any damages as a result of an act or omission so long as the care was provided and we'll go over the three steps. But you see that? An act or omission. So an omission, the fact that you didn't do something. So if you're not comfortable with something, you don't have to do it. As long as it was in good faith, for no money or consideration, the person was not grossly negligent. So in good faith, so if you purposely don't do something that could be life-saving, let's say the person gets in like further injured, life-altering, or dies, and it comes down to, hey, why didn't you do that? And you say, I didn't feel I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't I didn't I felt like I didn't know it well enough. I felt like I was gonna hurt somebody. That's in good faith. So you'll be fine there. Uh, for no money or consideration. So I can't walk up to somebody that crashed, do all my work, get them ready to go into the ambulance and say, okay, here's your bill. Can't do that. Person was not grossly negligent. We're going to talk about scope of practice. So right now you guys are bystanders. Okay. So there's bystanders, first responders, EMTs, paramedics. You know, it just keeps going on and on and on. The more sk skill and training you have, your wider scope of practice. So the area of where you can work in. So as a bystander, we're not teaching you how to do tracheotomy. We're not teaching you how to apply a traction splint. These are all things that we're not teaching you yet. So you can't do that. Okay. So that's out of your scope. So anyways, Arizona's Good Samaritan Law does not impose a duty to help people or criminal liability for failure to act. Once again, an omission. So if you choose not to stop, not a big deal. It's your choice. It really is your choice. All right. So where to get more information? So if you want to increase your scope of practice, if you want to add more, because these are things that we don't apply in this course, is CPR, motorcycle safety classes, and the medical responder or EMS classes. So if you want to get CPR, here's all the resources you have. If you want to take a motorcycle safety class, here's all the resources you can get right there. Once again, I'm an MSF rider coach for Rider Arizona MTC. So if you'd like to come out and train that with me out in Arizona, well, there you go. Also, if you want to you know, go further, if you want to get more training, more and more training, uh, maybe take an EMS class or a first responder class at your local college. See if uh, your local fire department actually puts anything on. Learn the acronym PACT. Uh, prevent further injury, assess the situation, contact EMS, 
and treat the injured with life-sustaining care using ABCSS of trauma. So that last one's a little bit hard to remember. So just kind of kind of think of this way, preventing, you're assessing, you're contacting, and then you're treating. Okay, so PACT. So, all right, you guys ready for the first one? All right, so PACT. This is what it's all about. This is uh, we're gonna we're gonna start preventing further injury. Okay, so prevent further injury. We're gonna secure the scene. What does that mean? The scene is the area of where the incident, where where the crash, and where all the things are happening. Most likely, we're on the road, right? So the scene is the road portion of the road. Maybe it's a cliff. Maybe there's wild animals around. Maybe it's in a bad area, and you have to start thinking about you know maybe getting shot or robbed. But these are all things that you need to start thinking about. And securing it means, you know, the main thing is traffic. And we're going to learn how to direct traffic pretty soon. But secure it by so you don't get hit. Secure it so that when the motorcycle catches fire, you don't get burned. These are all little things. So protect yourself by taking proper precautions. So we're going to be wearing gloves. We're going to be wearing glasses and a few other things. And we're going to be talking about how to, you know, lift a bike if we have to so we don't hurt ourselves. Once again, moving the motorcycle if necessary and moving the injured if necessary. And we'll go over that. All right. So who's in charge? Who's in charge? Uh, one person takes charge. Okay. This person will most likely be you because you're taking this class. You're you're learning what you needs to be done. Therefore, if you take charge, you can start directing people. Okay. Does that make sense? Now, somebody with a higher skill and, and has more experience, let's say an EMT, an off-duty EMT or off-duty firefighter or even off-duty cop, anybody with a higher level of experience, it's okay if they take charge and now you work under them. Now you have the skill set that they can definitely use. So for the first, first and foremost, most likely you're going to be taking charge. So we're going to move the uninvolved vehicles off the road and use your emergency flashers. That's very important because you want to have your bike and everything out of the way so that people can see the scene so firefighters and EMTs can actually show up and be there. And that's what we're going to talk about is leaving roughly 100 feet open on either side of the crash for emergency vehicles. That way the ambulance can get right next to the patient, fire truck can get right next to the patient, all the personnel can get right next to the patient. We don't want to be blocking them because that's reducing the effectiveness of EMS. We're trying to increase the effectiveness of EMS, okay? All right. Be seen. Very important. Now, you see these guys right here. They're wearing reflective vests while they're riding. Now, they're not wearing jackets, which, uh, yeah, I don't like that, but they're visible, right? You can see them. And it's not just at night, it's also during the day. So if you can, pack a very small reflective vest in your saddlebag, your backpack, or anything like that. So if you're ever on an accident scene, throw that thing on. And it's not to say, hey, look at me, I have a vest. No, it's so other people can see you. Quite literally, it's so other people can see you. You'd be surprised how many uh, police officer, EMS, fatalities happen because a car wasn't paying attention and couldn't see them. Once again, our biggest uh, issue as motorcyclists, they didn't see me. This way, uh, hopefully they do, okay? Use LED lights if you can, okay? There's some really cool little, little puck things that they will fit inside your saddlebag at the very bottom, and they're very bright, okay? And position yourself to be seen. So once again, we talk about posi lane positioning while riding a motorcycle so we can be seen. Position yourself so you can be seen, okay? So wear the gear, wear everything. It's very important. All right, so how to control traffic. So we're going to send somebody at least 100 feet in either direction. Okay, so you know eastbound, westbound, northbound, southbound, whatever it is, you're, we need to send somebody way up there, 100 feet at least, 100 feet back that way to control traffic, at least to slow them down. It's not necessarily to stop traffic. It's better to stop traffic, but here's the thing. If we could just at least slow them down enough to where they see this motorcyclist going, hey, 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 stop, 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 slow down, slow down, slow down. They'll slow down enough to where they're like, hey, what's that? that? That guy was weird. Oh, there's an accident here. Instead of getting that target fixation of driving straight almost to the accident, looking, boom, hitting them. And by hitting them, I mean hitting me, hitting the patient, hitting all my friends. So it's good to slow people down and get somebody's attention before then. Uh, on the highway, it's best to send at least two people if you have the resources because at highway speeds, it's hard to see. It's hard to see a small little person. So two people, better. If you're on a curve, send somebody around the curve. It does no good if you stand after the curve and that's where the accident happened, right? Stand before the curve, slow people down so that way when they get around the curve, they when they see the accident, they're not getting target fixated on that. Same thing with a hill. I mean, the hill's a blind curve, but just going up and down, right? So send somebody at the top of the hill to slow people down if you possibly can. 
All right, so total stopping distance, reaction distance, regular stopping distance, feet per second, all these different things. There you go. Simple as that. Miles per hour times four, you estimate the stopping distance and the distances in feet. So at 55 miles per hour, the reason why it says reaction distance is 60 feet is because it takes about half a second to a full second for you to realize, hey, I have to start to stop. So part of the MSF, that is what? Search, evaluate. There it is. Search, evaluate. So you actually have to actively be searching. You have to actually evaluate if you have to stop or not. And then, boom, you start applying the brakes and your stopping distance is 125 feet at 55 miles per hour. So you have to add both of those. You have to add the moment you decided to stop, the moment you started to stop, and the moment you stopped fully. And that's a total of 185 feet. That's over half a football field. American football field. Um, 85 feet, it's ridiculous. It's almost 400. And that's if you react within a second. Car drivers don't do that. <laughs> they don't. So realize that. So 100 feet above or above the incident and below the incident, maybe do a little bit more. Maybe we do about 200 feet. All right. So how, how others can make us sick. Now, this one... This is one of the biggest fears that I think a lot of people have when it comes to touching other people, especially when they have blood on them. And guess what? In a motorcycle accident, there's more than likely going to be blood. So bloodborne pathogens, that's the fluid contact. Now you can get HIV, HCV, HCV, or other potentially infectious materials, OPIM. Now so HIV is pretty much the common one that everyone is so concerned about, but I'm actually concerned about HCV and HCB. That is hepatitis C and hepatitis B. HIV tends to die pretty quick when it's exposed to the air, but HCV, hepatitis C and hepatitis B, they can last a long time. So we're going to go actually go over some precautions on how to take care of your gear afterwards. So that one I'm a little more worried about. So airborne pathogens, inhalation contact. So you're over there talking to the patient, you're holding C-spine, they cough in your face. If they had the flu... Guess what? You got it too. If they have whooping cough, pertussis, that should be eradicated, but vaccines aren't as common as, as we hope they are, uh, you can actually get that. That's the 100-day cough. Not good. TB, tuberculosis, very uh, common and very, very, very infectious and communicable. So make sure you wear a mask or maybe even put a mask on the patient. Uh, meningitis, so that can be bacterial or viral not good okay so that attacks your brain stem and attacks your brain so skin pathogens physical contact actually touching the patient without gloves um skin to skin contact anything that's broken skin is is not good but you can get a staph infection those things are pretty uh nasty and they're not they're not easy to get rid of and what's even worse and hard to get harder to get rid of is MRSA now MRSA is a resistant form of staph infection and yeah, that's no good. And there's a lot of people with MRSA. You got to watch out for that. Uh, impetigo, not good either. Um, that is a lot like a dermatitis and inflammation of the, uh, the dermal skin, which is very infectious and can cause a lot of problems for you. Chicken pox and shingles, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised people have it, especially the shingles as an older generation. Um, it's not good. That's that's very contagious. So what can we do about diseases? Now, this is something that is kind of scary. It's one of the reasons why people don't touch other people is uh, germs. So what can we do? Well, wear your gear. Wear your personal protective equipment. We talk about wearing ATGAT, all the gear, all the time. When it comes to riding a motorcycle, dress for the slide, not the ride. All these different fancy schmancy terms. Um, personal protective equipment. It's just simple as that. Personal protective equipment. So the you see the nurse on the left. She's wearing full protective equipment. You can't really tell, but she does have a face mask, especially for her eyes. So she's got a splash shield there. But she's got everything. She's covered head to toe in full gear. And then you look over here to the motorcyclist, and he's got full gear. Isn't that what we're wearing, though? We're wearing that when we're out riding, or at least we should be wearing that while we're riding. So this doesn't allow a lot of contact skin to skin which is good. You also notice he's wearing goggles or safety glasses or, you know, riding glasses. And you also notice he has his hair pulled back by a hat and he has a bandana around his mouth and his nose. So that right there is going to help prevent a lot of airborne, a lot of particulate type stuff to travel into the body. Uh, it's not going to stop everything, but it's better than nothing. Now, if you want to carry extra gear, this is what I do. 
I actually have a spare nighttime type glasses and I call them nighttime glasses. They're really the same glasses he's wearing. But if I'm riding, I usually use a tint advisor. I use a tint advisor on my helmet. And if I get caught out in, you know, at night and it gets too dark, so the tint advisor is no good. So I have to lift it up. Now I'm going to have a possibility of an eye injury while I'm riding. That's not good. So what I like to do is I get to keep a pair of clear glasses at the bottom of my saddlebag, nice and protected, so they don't get all scratched up. And then if it gets to that point, I just throw those on. I have a set of eye protection while riding. Well, guess what? If I already have them in my bag, I have them when I'm over on scene. So multi-purpose, that's what I use these things for. Uh, nitrile glove, same thing, multi-purpose. Yeah, anybody here change their oil? Anybody change any fluids? Anybody do any woodworking? I do a lot of woodworking. And when it comes to painting and staining and doing all those things, I tend to like to use nitrile gloves so I keep my hands from being stained for a couple days. Throw a few in the bag. Also, another thing that I like to keep is an N95 mask. Once again, I have one. I actually have a bunch in the shop right now to keep my lungs safe from when I'm sanding all the, all the wood. So just throw a few in there. So if there's anybody coughing, you might suspect, you know, uh, tuberculosis or anything like that, I'll put one on. So I am protected with my eyes, my, my airborne, and then I'll have gloves for protection. All right. So don't spread any germs. So let's say you're helping the patient and now it's time to leave. Okay, so it's time to leave. So how do we still prevent it? Because once again, until you are fully decontaminated, the scene isn't over. The incident isn't over. So avoid touching your mouth, nose, and eyes. You've probably have heard all this stuff from the health department. Do not eat or drink without washing hands. Once again, you probably heard that from the health department. Uh, it's very important because even if, even though you know everything's fine, it looks clean, everything, you could still have some uh, pathogens on your hands or on your face. Now you're touching your eyes, which has mucous membranes inside your nose, same thing. That's how you can give medications because the mucous membranes, the blood vessels, mouth is an obvious one. But remember, everything you touched is contaminated. Absolutely everything you touch. So like this little uh, clicker that I have to control the slides, if this was on scene somehow, this thing is contaminated. I need to clean this off. So your pens, keys, your pants, your jacket, all those things. So the things that you can throw away, like a disposable pen, like I got a disposable pen right here, you can throw this away. I would throw it away. There's no point in really washing it. Uh, but your pants and jacket, you're probably going to want to wash because you don't want to throw that away. Do that as soon as possible, absolutely as soon as possible. And keep a record of what you touched, like in, at least a mental record of it. All right, so scene integrity. So once again, we're trying to in increase the effectiveness of EMS and police at the end of the day. So we don't want to move the involved vehicle. So I'm wondering in this picture how this motorcycle crashed and then all of a sudden laid up on their side stand. So that's what I'm a little, I'm like, what's that? So somebody must have moved that. And that really does affect the investigation of EMS and police. So police, they uh, investigate in terms of who's at fault and what happened during the incident in terms of legality. EMS, when they roll up on scene, they, they show up and, and they see motorcycles on the ground, how they're laid, all these different things. That right there is painting a picture of a mechanism of injury. And we're going to talk about mechanism of injury. So if you start moving things, it really confuses people. It really does. So the best thing you can possibly do is gather names, some phone numbers of possible witnesses, and get that ready for police. So somebody sees an accident, they see it, they're like, oh man, that sucks. Like I just saw it, but I have to get to work, so I have to leave, and they take off. It doesn't help the victim. It doesn't help anybody at all. It doesn't help EMS. So the one thing you can do is say, hey, is it all right if I get your name and number? I'm going to give it to the police. Uh, it looks like you have to go, but is it okay if I do that? And if they say, yeah, well, there you go. If they say no, well, don't just, don't badger them. Like I write there in, in parentheses, disorderly conduct. So they will stay now because you're being a jerk and they're going to tell the police that you're being a jerk. Take lots of pictures. We have awesome cell phones nowadays. Even the flip phones have a ton of memory for, for pictures. Uh, take pictures of signs, take pictures of the accident, take pictures of the other vehicles, take pictures of sta uh, people standing by, uh, witnesses, take pictures of everything. There should be 20 plus pictures of a motorcycle accident, okay? All right, so when to move the motorcycle or patient. So this is actually very important to, to realize when and, and how and all those things. So in general, a patient should be moved immediately in emergency move, okay? It's an emergency move. Only when, there's a huge list here. I'm gonna tell you right now, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, only time you move somebody, only time you move somebody is if 
where they stay will kill them. If they're underneath the motorcycle, catches fire, and it'll kill them, you need to move them. If they're in the middle of a highway, in the middle of the road, and there's cars just swerving, swerving, swerving around them, your best bet is to hold traffic if you can to protect yourself, but you got to move them out of the way. If their head, like their life-saving care, cannot be given because of the patient's location or position, the patient's head is under the motorcycle. So if they are not breathing and their head's underneath the motorcycle, you can't get to their uh, airway to breathe for them, then yeah, that's when you move them. But honestly, if they're underneath the motorcycle and they're like, hey, everything's fine. I'm good. I'm not hurt. I'm not burning. I'm breathing. I'm Everything's good. Then you don't have to move them. So it sounds kind of weird. Sounds kind of weird. But how do we move the motorcycle if we have to, right? This is a great picture right here, but I'm going to have a video playing right here. I did a video on how to pick up a motorcycle by yourself. Two different ways. I highly recommend watching that so you can kind of get an idea of this. Um, I'll put a link in the description. So anyways, uh, one rescue, lift from the handlebars, turn handlebars away from the injured and squat and use those thigh muscles. So that's the best thing that you could possibly do. A lot of people do one lift, uh, one type of motorcycle lift, and that is, you know, putting their back towards the seat, squatting up and walking up. Now, remember if the patient's underneath the motorcycle, you're not going to have that room to do that. So grabbing the handlebars is the best bet. So you're offset from the patient. Um, two rescue method, it's the same thing. One person's at the handlebars lifting up, the other person's at the tail section lifting up at the frame. Okay. All right. So what about moving the patient instead? You know, if you can't lift the motorcycle, you know, all the way, let's say you have a back injury, right? Or you're, you're uh, not as strong to lift that motorcycle in, in that way. Um, so there could be a time where moving the patient is actually better. So if the patient can do it themselves, like you literally can just ask them, Hey, can you get your leg from underneath that bike? Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay, cool. Thank you. Please do that. Or if all you have to do is lift it up just a little bit to get them out of the way. It's very important to do that. That way you're not hurting your back trying to lift something that's extremely heavy, to be honest. All right, so in the ASM 100 basic class, you will learn these different things, okay? The log roll, the blanket drag, the armpit drag, and the recovery position, okay? These are all hands-on things that you'll have an instructor guiding you, telling you how to do it, showing you how to do it. Uh, with that said, here are some videos that I hope you'll enjoy.